Uh, let's see. So I, I promised you seven tips to build the learning culture, and I'm going to give you a bunch of tips uh, to drive the right organizational values. And we talked about this. These are values that connote the importance of learning. Uh, then I'm going to give you a few examples on the, um, the way in which you can develop a learning strategy that supports the business strategy. And then I'm going to give you a few tips on some processes that drive day-to-day -day learning. And what I've done in this presentation is there's a lot of the content is sort of is is written out in long form, so you can get a copy of this at the end of the presentation and so to some extent this presentation will stand a little bit on its own, so you can use this you can go back um, back and use this, um, you know, if you want to refresh your memory on this so. Tip one, and this is around the organizational organizational values that affirm learning's importance so tip one promote learning opportunities and the benefits. Promote, promote, promote. So why do you do this? Well, L&D departments that promote the opportunities and benefits of their learning programs send a really strong message to their employees regarding the value of learning and the importance of learning as a key pillar of learning culture. Okay, so how are you going to do this? You look for every opportunity to embed learning in your HR communications. Key, some of the key opportunities include promoting benefits and opportunities to potential employees. So when you're reaching out through your talent acquisition chain, promote the benefits and opportunities of learning when you come to when people come to the company. Second, market your learning programs to your existing employees. And so you can think about whenever there's an email that goes out to all employees from HR, can you somehow work in the importance of learning within that in that uh, communication? So celebrating learner outcomes and business benefits of training is another way of doing this. I remember at, at Discover, one of the things we um, we were trying to do when I left is take over a portion of a, of, of a, a walkway. Everyone went from one building to another through an elevated walkway, and there are these um, – uh, there were these big panels of granite that were there, and they had sort of um, examples of Discover's marketing over the years. We were trying to take over one of those pillars and start um, uh, engraving people's names in it, people who graduated from our, um, from our free college program. So can you uh, can you celebrate learner outcomes? So so a few additional considerations just to think about as you're doing this. Consider working with the broader HR team to integrate the value of learning into your former in, form, formal employee value proposition. You know it would be helpful if you have an employee value proposition. Like why should people come work at your company? If you can work learning into that, it will drive all of HR communications around learning. And I'll just give you one. Quick example. So this is AT and T. AT and T has this page um, about perks of working at AT and T. You'll notice that there are two of the seven perks are really about learning. So graduating, uh, there. This is their their education assistance program. Upgrading your skill set. What's important here is not necessarily the nature of the programs. What's important is how they communicate it. That it's embedded within the way they view of perks of working at AT and T. Um, so tip two. Involve organizational leaders in your training programs. And so what I mean by this is companies that engage in ex executives to deliver and lead L&D programs make a really strong statement about the value of learning to the entire organization. If your chief executive officer is standing up in front of people talking about their learning, that sends a message to everyone else. Now, how are you gonna do this? Well, engage your C-suite and your executives in a discussion about how they could participate in company-wide training programs. So many of your leaders are already gonna be looking for more formal opportunities to contribute to the development of others. And that's, you know, particularly, executives as they get on later in their years and they're close to retirement, they're thinking about how they can contribute to the success of others. So formal leading teachings, lead, leaders teaching leaders programs are really a great way for leaders to expand their impact. And so here's some additional consideration. The more you can make it fun and easy for your leaders, the greater the likelihood of success. So consider lunch and learn sessions panel discussions, fireside chat interviews is a way to keep the time investment of, um, of, of every executive low. This is a, something that uh, you know we, we, we worked on at Discover as we had uh, the chief financial officer. He was great at just, at just looking at a P&L statement and understanding what was going on. And this is something he had developed over years. And we got him to go in front of a, a group of our high potential employees and actually talk about how he looked at P&Ls. Like, how do you look at a P&L and sort of understand the value of a portfolio. And he was willing to do that. And it was super easy for him. Um, 
because it was something that he did every day. He could roll out of bed and do this. And uh, he did it and it was, it, 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 it helped our people learn and it connoted the, the, the value of learning. Uh, so here are a couple of examples. So at GE, uh, has uh, had this Crottonville executive development program. And so, you know, one of the things they did is that executive took a six month assignment to teach leaders uh, in their GE executive development program. Now, uh, GE is actually in the news quite a bit. There's a book that just came out called uh, the, Man Who, uh, the Man Who Broke Capitalism or The Man Who Destroyed Capitalism. And it's a very critical review of Jack Welch. Not everything he did was bad. You know, executive development is actually pretty impressive that uh, he got executives to take six month assignments to just be teachers, which I think is is really impressive. Uh, Best Buy, here's another example. They have this new leader integration program. And the way the program worked is that um, they had a learning program that was augmented by peer learning and mentorship programs designed to in ensure that new leaders could learn from established leaders. And so their leaders participated in this. And, and as, uh, as uh, uh, leaders went through the learning program, there were other leaders that were, were signed up as mentors. Okay, so obviously there's great learning there, but what's more important is the message you're saying about learning, that you have your executives involved in it. It's that important to them. Uh, the third tip around uh, organizational values is do your best to implement education-friendly HR policies. And so why would you do this? Well, education-friendly HR policies, especially when clearly articulated and promoted, like we talked about earlier, illustrate how the organization is willing to back up its support for learning and development. So how can you do this? Well, spend some time talking to employees to find out what gets in the way of participating in formal and informal learning opportunities. So consider a few problems um, or a few policies that are likely to address the following issues. So one, a high cost of tuition. So when you talk to employees about why they don't have it, uh, why they're not, not getting a degree, oftentimes they'll say the high cost of tuition, the high cost of books, supplies, academic fees. Oftentimes they'll say inflexible work schedules. Oftentimes they say approvals are requested for internal training. It's hard to get an approval. Oftentimes they'll say participation restrictions based on tenure or level or location. So if you can understand what those barriers are, you can start putting in place policies to actually increase increase the, the ability of people to participate in education. So here are a couple, a couple additional considerations. Research best practices promoted by the De Detroit Re Regional Chamber of Commerce. They have some great best practices, I know because I've seen them. Uh, and, uh, and various other nonprofits focused on workforce development and really think through what are those barriers and how you can lift those barriers and, and decrease the friction around learning. So this is, uh, this is a little bit self-serving, but Discover really, you know, I think we really focused on this quite a lot. And um, the program that we rolled out, it's actually since been renamed, was called the Discover College Commitment. And so what we did is we we paid 100% of tuition, books, supplies, fees uh, towards one of seven high quality um, uh, bachelor's degree programs. I know that um, um, I know that uh, that this is um, um, they, they've actually increased the number of degrees and they've actually partnered with uh, with the um, on HBCU, which is which is wonderful. And so that's that's you know, they're they're making a statement because they have policies that actually make it easier to get your degree. United Healthcare is another example for many roles. United Healthcare offers flexible schedules for students. So if you're a student, you know, you can you can talk to your manager and they'll get you a flexible schedule. And this once again lifts one of the barriers. All right. So those are those are three trips uh, tips around the organizational values. And uh, before we go on to the next uh, the next main pillar, which is uh, um, uh, learning strategy that supports business strategy, maybe we'll stop and see if there are any questions here. I just one, and I'll just share the answer with everyone about um, someone was inquiring about whether or not the slides will be available after the presentation, and they will be. Um, the slides will be available as well as some additional resources. Awesome. That's an easy question to answer. Good, but good question. All right, let's move on to the second pillar of an organizational culture, and this is closely aligned business and learning strategies. And I'll give you tip four is implement learning programs that drive strategic business results. Okay, and why would you do this? Well, L&D departments, they can actually show this clear alignment between business between business drivers and learning strategies are gonna provide far more relevant training and actually gonna get much better executive support. So if you can say, hey, you know, our learning, our learning program, our whole learning strategy is designed to support the main business drivers of this company, 
you will get all your executives going to be support in support of your learning program. Now, how do you do this? Well, take your company's business strategy and see if you can answer the following questions. And they're just four main questions that I would try to answer. How do we ensure that the company has the right talent to successfully undertake this strategy? Number two, what is our role in developing talent? So sometimes often, you know, the, the, the company strategy, you actually, it's better to hire from the outside than develop internal talent. So really understand what talent you're going to develop. So what's our role in, de in developing the talent? Number three, what capabilities and support do we need to uh, in order to succeed? And then finally, how do we align L&D success metrics with business objectives? Okay. And so a few additional considerations, share your plan widely and prepare your elevator pitch. Ensure that all L&D employees, uh, employees are clear on how L&D's goals support the strategic business initiatives of the company. Okay. I'll give you two examples. Okay. Dollar General. So Dollar General, their, their customer strategy was really around customer centricity. They said the, the way we're going to win is by really understanding our customer, right? And so L&D's focus was really around driving customer centricity. And what they did is that all training programs seek to help employees understand their core customers. It, that was an embedded element in every single learning program. You couldn't take a learning program without it, it talking about understanding the customer better. So the outcomes, customer satisfaction actually increased by 790 basis points after the strategic alignment of the, the L&D program. So this is a really good example where you hear your employees, say, your, your leaders say, it's about customer centricity. The head of L&D said, huh, it's about customer centricity. Well, let's make sure that all our L&D programs talk about the customer and help employees learn about the customer better. And as a result, that actually drove the business. Okay, Edward Jones, great example. Um, their company strategic focus was improved diversity and inclusion. And this was because they saw a lot of future business coming from black and brown communities. And they felt like they could not succeed without having a much higher level of diversity and inclusion within the company. So LND's focus actually was in uh, internal business coaches for women and people of color. And what they did is they rolled out a whole program that actually created um, internal business co coaches uh, for, for um, all their women or all their women leaders and all their people of color. And what they saw is that after implementing that program, the um, attrition in target populations actually dropped by 27%. Okay, so this is a really good example where where the head of learning could just draw a very clear line. We want to grow in, in black and brown communities. In order to do that, we have to have greater diversity within within our company. And in order to ensure that that happens, we have this internal um, internal business coaches for women and people of color to make sure that they're growing, they feel valued by the company. So great example of learning programs that drive strategic business results. All right. Uh, now we've got I've, I've got, I think, uh, three. Let's see. We've got three tips around designing processes that ingrain learning in the day-to-day -day activities of employees, okay? And um, this is the first one is require job role training and require robust job role training. So oftentimes you go to a company and they don't really tell you how to do your job. You kind of got to pick that up by yourself. So requiring robust job role training not only helps ensure that each new employee is fully productive before they start their work, it also sends a very clear message that learning is critical to the success of every employee. Now, how are you going to do this? Well, job role training can be super expensive. I've done it myself, you know, try to train people on how to do their jobs. It's expensive. It's time consuming. There's a lot of different job roles. Consider building formal onboarding programs only for the most common job, job roles in the company and use what we call as a federated model for less common job roles. What that means is that you're providing business units, the tools and templates and processes for building their own content, disseminating it and tackling um, job role and for job role training for more niche positions. So what we did at Discover is, is we actually made sure that, that all business units had tools and templates. They could post their content to the learning management system and they could actually build their own uh, job role training for their niche jobs. And we took over responsibility for those job roles where we had several hundred people hired every year. So some additional considerations, be wary of overcommitting. Start by enabling business units to provide their own training programs for newly hired employee, employees and take over responsibility for augmenting and running only those programs for which you have internal resourcing. Now, 
I've seen this before where, where uh, leaders make commitments, hey, we're going to provide job role training for everyone. And then they find out that there are 10 times as many job roles as they thought, and they can't, they can't, you know, they can't live up to their commitments. So be, start by creating the tools and templates so business units can create their own jo um, job role training and make sure that that's easy for them. Here's an example, Valvoline. So Valvoline actually has the Oil Chain Super Pro certification, which is a 270 um, hour program for all newly hired employees. They run everyone through it. Um, and essentially when you complete that program, they have a certification that determines the job roles, promotions, compensations. It's just really baked into their internal processes. And that ensures that when people join the company, they can be really successful and they understand how the business actually works. So that's critical. All right, uh, tip six, uh, learning, uh, tie learning to performance management. Now, a um, uh, caveat here, if everyone hates performance management at your company, maybe you want to avoid this one. But if you know, if you feel like you've got a pretty good performance management system, it's really well accepted by your managers and your leaders. See how you can tie tie learning to performance management. So, why would you do this? Companies that leverage existing performance management process to drive increased training actually gain more management participation in the development of their employees. Okay, and what's critical about this is getting managers involved. So how are you going to do this? Just consider requiring individual development activities or an added learning goal for each employee as part of the standard goal setting process. You know, for 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 um, for some employees, it, it may not be valuable, but what you get is you get 100% of, of, of employees get actually some conversation about learning and some learning goal within their within their annual performance review. And that actually drives more learning. So here's some ad additional considerations. Using the performance management profit process to drive greater consumption of learning resources by itself may have little impact on uh, employee development. So consider implementing a management development program that helps managers grow into more effective development coaches. So the critical piece here is that if you require this and it's a check the box box exercise, it's not going to do anything. On the other hand, if you actually have managers who are capable of having better conversation with their employees, uh, you know, you this actually will drive some pretty significant outcomes. So, uh, so think about that. Here, here are a few examples. Coca-Cola and PwC, both of them require formalized learning goals to be part of their performance management process. For each of these, it wouldn't really make a difference if, uh, you know, if it was a check the box exercise, but both Coca-Cola and PwC have invested in ensuring that their managers are really good coaches. So they're much more effective at talking to their employees about and making those goals, making those learning goals come to life. And it's about tying those learning goals to the employee's career aspirations. And it's about following up with that learning learning goal and seeing how the employees perceive the learning and helping them uh, helping them use that learning. So, uh, so that's how tying learning to performance management can be helpful. All right, uh, the last tip, tip number seven, uh, adjust your hiring profile to target enthusiastic learners. Now, why would you do this? Well, companies that hire enthusiastic learners will need to expend less effort on the creation, the dissemination, and the management of formal learning programs. So work with your company's talent acquisition team to update company-wide job profile requirements, help them include interview questions and candidate selection pro protocols that select for your learning aptitude. And really make sure that you communicate any changes broadly to your entire population of leaders so that they understand the reasons behind the change. All right, I'm gonna give you two examples. Uh, in Google, Eric Schmidt once said, uh, at Google, they seek learning animals, people who are naturally driven to learn on their own. So Google ha has, has figured out that the, um, that the rest, uh, figure out faster than the rest that the key to keeping their teams at peak performance is to choose employees who are predisposed to learn and grow on their own. To the extent that you can make this a requirement for getting a job at your company, it actually makes uh, makes people, you know, this is once again, the horse metaphor, just get the, get the horses who are more likely to drink the water and you're, you know, they're, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get them to learn a lot faster. Uh, Jump Ramp, this is a gaming company, um, and their, their CEO and founder said, one of the most difficult challenges at a startup is keeping pace with rapidly evolving needs of a growing company. Um, hiring for intellectual curiosity means that candidates are not only qualified and thoughtful, but they're capable of thinking beyond the role that they're interviewing for. 
And this is what actually mean, ma makes such a big difference is when you actually get people, uh, people in who are enthusiastic learners. We're, we're just talking re um, just a few minutes ago about the social element of behavior. You get to a tipping point. The more people you get who are enthusiastic learners, they carry everyone else around because it becomes just what people do at our company. And so even unenthusiastic le learners become enthusiastic learners when they're surrounded by natural learners. All right, I'm just going to stop right there and see what questions we have. What questions do we have? Yes. Um, so the question that we have is if you could talk about the role that frontline supervisors and managers uh, play in supporting uh, learning for their direct reports. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. Um, so and uh, I'll, there was um, there was a study not long ago, I'd say, boy, actually, it's becoming longer ago now that I think of when it was <laughs> maybe eight years ago uh, that Gartner did. And what Gartner did is they they do great studies. They they bought a um, um, they bought the call, I think is called the college, the CEB, the college executive board, maybe. Um, I think that's what it was called. And they had this, um, um, this big research function and the research was great. And what they did is they tried to try to identify what type of coaches make the most effective managers. And they, they, they defined, I think three different profiles or archetypes of coaches. And they look to see which ones actually were most successful with employee um, with uh, employee retention, and which coaches uh, were most highly correlated to business success? And the three different archetypes. I'll see if I can remember them. Uh, the first was the always on coach. The coach is always saying, "Hey, can I give you a little feedback? Uh, instead of doing this, do that." Okay. Uh, can I give you a little feedback? Uh, from now on, I want you to do these things. Uh, I, I, I heard you on this call. I'd like you to do it like this, right? So that's the always on coach. Some of us have had those folks. Um, the second is the coach as the teacher. And that's a coach who basically says, I'm going to teach you what I know. I'm going to spend a lot of time and talk to you about, you know, how to be successful in this job, how to be successful in the company. They see their as a teacher. The third archetype was the uh the 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 manager as the connector the manager who would say you know something i don't know all the answers but i do know people who know a lot of answers so why don't i introduce you to this person over here and they um they've actually been really successful in this thing that you're interested in and let's sit down and talk about how you know um i'm going to send an email out i'm going to introduce the two i'm going to make it you know make it easy for you to go to coffee with them let's talk about how you're going to drive that discussion and let's make sure that when you go to that discussion that you you get the most out of it and then when they, the employee comes back the manager says so what'd you learn how valuable is that going to be? How are you going to use that information? You know something. I know of two other people you can talk to if you're interested in learning more. It turns out that if you look at those three different archetypes of, of coaches, uh, the first two, the coach, the always on coach and the coach as a teacher, actually their um, those archetypes um, have a, uh, a negative correlation with business results. They actually de they actually decrease business results of their employees. And the reason is because it just feels oppressive to most em employees. And oftentimes, you know, the manager as a teacher actually doesn't know everything. You know, if you're with a manager, you know, you're going to get most of what they know in the first six months. Right. And then after that, it's like you probably heard it all before. The the manager as the connector actually had enormous results in driving in, in driving business performance. They had lower retention, higher engagement, higher performance of their employees. And it's because they were able to find are, um, areas of the company that that would be genuinely learning experience for their employees, set up those those uh, learners for success when they actually talk to those leaders. And then when they came back, help them use that information. So that's a sort of a long-winded answer to your question. But what I'd say is that the most effective uh, learning coaches as managers are coaches that don't believe they know everything. They're, 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 they're people who are willing to, to use their own personal and professional network to grow their employees. Um, and that's actually what drives, what drives uh, business performance of their employees. Chris, does that, that answer your question? I guess it may, may not have been your question, but does that answer the question? I think it does. Thank you, John. Sure, sure, sure. What other questions do we have? Um, that was the last. Oh, wait, we have one more question. Um, someone asked if you could spell Alizon coach. I'm sorry, say, say that one more time. Uh, the question was, and I'm hoping I'm understanding this question correctly. She just asked, um, could you spell the Alizon coach? 
I think she's asking and referring to something that you mentioned earlier. The hmm. first archetype. What's the, fir the first? Oh, the first archetype. Oh, the first archetype is the always on coach. Oh, always I'm on sorry. Always sorry. On. I saw yeah. <laughs> No, 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 my bad. I, 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 I'm sure I mumbled it. So <laughs> the uh, always on coach, the never off coach. That's the way to th think about that archetype. Okay. Um, I can look through, uh, you know, uh, Christy, why don't I look through, I'll see if I can find that, find that study. Um, that study, I, I know that, um, that to get that study, we had to be, we had to be a member of Gartner and we had to pay, you know, sort of a Gartner level fees to get access to it, but there may be something that's, uh, that's available. I'll see if I can find that. All right. So we're going to do a quick summary. Uh, so first of all, a learning culture is designed by is defined by three different attributes: organizational values that af affirm learning's importance, okay, um, closely aligned business and learning strategies, processes that ingrain learning in the day-to-day -day activities of each employee. Um, a learning culture is really critical to keeping up with today's business disruptions, and that's because you no longer have time to spend uh, to basically have a small set of employees figure out what change means. You actually have to have everyone involved in changing in real time. Uh, and recommendations I would give you is um, are the following seven. Promote learning opportunities and benefits to your employees and your potential employees. Number two. Involve leaders in learning programs, and I'm a huge fan of, of, of leaders teaching leaders programs. Make it easy for your executives to get up in front of other people and share their, their wisdom. Um, implement education-friendly HR policies. So they're, they're, as HR professionals, we're, um, we typically don't fully understand the barriers to participating in education that our employees face. So if you can understand those barriers, you can start implementing policies that actually lift those barriers and decrease friction. Uh, number four, implement learning programs that drive strategic business results. And this is all about trying to understand what is your business strategy and how you can align your learning strategy to drive that business strategy. Uh, require robust job role training. This is the thing that's gonna be super time consuming, but if you can get it right, it, it, it drives enormous returns. Uh, number six, tie learning to performance management. Only if your performance management um, uh, system is is uh, is working well at your company, do not tie learning to a uh, do not tie tie learning to the uh, Titanic of the uh, of performance management if everyone hates it. Uh, then and finally, adjust your hiring profile to target enthusiastic learners. All right. That's my story. That's what I'm sticking to. I'm going to uh, ask for any final questions before we go on. I, I know that Christy, Christy is going to add a few, a few final thoughts. What final questions do we have? Uh, just one. Um, um, how long would you recommend that a fireside side chat should be? And what would be the nature of those discussions? Yeah, so fireside chat is an hour, an hour or less. Um, the, the nature of it, you can think about it as, as an interview. And so basically um, you can think about someone is, is, is coming up with a set of questions. Usually that's, um, you know, you got, you got someone in your learning department who's really good in front of other people, you know, have them agree with the executive of the questions they're going to ask, have a theme to that. So I've, I've seen themes about how to, uh, you know, how to manage your career. That usually goes over really well. And if you can come up with questions that allows the, the executive to sort of extemporaneously talk about how they've managed their career and what they've learned throughout the years, that can be super helpful. Um, but the, the wonderful thing about a fireside chat is it can be, um, it, it can be very low effort for the executive. They don't have to prepare a slides. They don't, they don't have to get up in fr front of it. They can sit down in front of people. They can just talk off the cuff. It's very informal. You can take questions from the audience. Um, you can really get people in their own element and they can just talk about what they've learned throughout their career. And usually these can be, uh, you know, these can be very, very helpful. And you can do a lot of them because executives are very willing to, if they'll, they'll say, wait, I don't have to prepare anything. No, no presentation. Yeah, sign me up. Uh, you know, I can do it over lunch. So, what other questions do we have? No other questions. I know Christy had some final thoughts that she. Oh wait, I'm sorry. One, one more question. Just one more question. <laughs> Any resources and advice on implementing some of these when staff, including leaders, are already spread thin, or maybe a brand best practice to start small. Yeah. So, how do you start small? Because uh, because your leaders. So, I mean, I, I mentioned that leaders. Uh, the key is getting leaders involved, right? 
And what do you do when your leaders are spread, uh, are spread super thin? Well, you have to really focus on how do you make it easy for leaders? And how do you get leaders to do something they already like to do? And what I found is, is things like the fireside chat, when you get leaders involved in, you know, sort of talking about what they've learned throughout their years, uh, when they're talking about them, leaders tend to be, tend to be, you know, pretty excited to do that. It's easy. It's something they're familiar with. So I, I would start small. And if you just were doing, doing sort of one thing, you know, see if you can get your executives to, to get up in front of groups of people who are hungry to learn and talk about about what they've learned throughout their career. And that's something that tends to be fairly low effort for the executive. It tends to send a great message. And usually those um, experiences, people tend to learn a lot of those experiences. They get to know your leaders in a way that, uh, that they wouldn't normally know, the, uh, know, the, know your leaders. And so it's culturally beneficial as well. Okay, thank you, great question. All right, let's, uh, um, last slide. Christy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, John. This was, as always, a wonderful discussion. Um, lots of great information. I just want to close by just reminding you that the Chamber has resources to help you implement and address all of the things that John talked about today. Um, some specific examples, I think, you know, John mentioned it's really important to do outreach about programs. Um, a lot of companies have great programs in place, but they're not telling the story to current or prospective employees. So folks just aren't aware of, of what's available to them. So we have developed with John a toolkit um, that has, you know, template emails that you can send outlining your benefits, um, staff meeting scripts, really tools that are plug and play, right? Like we have written the text for you. You just need to drop in your logo um, or bring a script to a staff meeting. And that's just one example of what's included in that toolkit. So um, the link is right here. We will send a follow-up email that includes the slides, um, the recording, although I hit record a bit late. So it'll be like <laughs> three fourths of the recording. Um, and you know other resources that are available. I highly encourage you to check out that toolkit and to follow up with me if there are questions um, that's really designed to be used in partnership with us at the chamber. Um, so you don't you don't have to go through it alone and and figure out what works best. We wanna we wanna consult with you and help you through that. So lots of resources, templates that you can use. Um, John also mentioned the importance of understanding the barriers that people face. And, and what's preventing them from accessing these types of opportunities. And we actually have a national partner that we work with on a survey that you can send to your employees that really captures their education aspirations and the barriers that are preventing them from taking advantage of education opportunities. So if you are interested in sending that out to your employees and getting a really good baseline of, of what people want and what's stopping them, um, reach out to me, my contact information is here. Um, would love to talk to you about how you get that in front of your employees. So this is the last of the webinar series, but I hope this is just the beginning of a conversation. We have tools, we have staff who are ready to help and support you. Um, and I suspect John will not be far away if, uh, if, if we want to do some deep dives later. I don't know, maybe I should commit you um, to Absolutely. a public audience. But. Nothing, nothing I'd rather do. That'd be great. <laughs> So, um, so we are here to help and support you. Look for a follow-up email from us in the next couple of days. And please don't be a stranger. We want to help you put some of these practices into place. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day and look for um, some follow-up from us soon. Thanks again, John. This was wonderful. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.